See, every time I start early, it doesn't go wrong. Good. That's a good rule. Yes. She says, oh no. Where are the viewers? There we go. There they are. So it's switched on. It's switched on. And people are watching. Oh. And how long have we got? Two minutes. We've got two minutes. We've got one minute. Okay. But this this can look beautiful on camera for a minute while people tune in. Okay. It'd look better if I took this off, wouldn't it? Yeah. Oh. Welcome to the Elven Village. <laughs> I never really intended this to be anything other than a wilderness, but the village it kind of crept in somehow. So what was pinned up on the board just now was some of the sketches. So that was the first sketch and that was going to be there and you can tell that I haven't done what I thought I would do. And then this is sketches for this area. So it's not really defined, it's not defined, oh I should start actually, well, good evening. <laughs> Ta -da. I'm going to put this back so I can work on it, so that's there. Thank you for joining us. Uh, but at once a week I say this picture will be finished by the next time we meet. And somehow it keeps not being. <laughs> so here it is, getting closer by the day um, and looking more habitable than I had first thought I would do. But nevertheless, I'm enjoying doing it. I'm liking the way it's evolving. And there's not much space to boo much more. Um, I will put something in the foreground and I am going to sort of nudge these things into some kind of form and do a little bit more in the background. So yeah, <laughs> having been wrong three or four times I feel it's safe to say we are very close to it being finished, maybe even only an hour or two. Um, I've photographed it at different stages and I've sent those pictures to Mike who's working with me to make up the album. So I think we might show some of the incremental steps in the album. Anyway, if not, I'll post them. So when I've worked here, I've scrubbed the paint and it's lifted paint off. And you know, the edge here, that's been done with a brush. And then I discovered something that really isn't an artist's brush at all. It's more like a scrubbing brush. And I have no idea how I came by it. But it's really an appalling brush to paint with. It's stiff and clumsy. It's more like a shovel. But because it's stiff and clumsy, it works great as a scrubbing brush. So I can take off paint quite well with that. And I've changed what was a window into a door here, the door here, and I'm gonna redo that one quite a bit, but that's just a detail. In terms of the form of the thing, this has got to be a mix of buildings and shrubbery. This here, is scratched off. I used it with a curved scalpel and I just lifted the paint off the highlights in the rough paper and it came off quite well so I didn't have anything really in mind I just was playing to see how it would work out.
Okay, so I'm going to sort of make a few fairly faint marks on this that will define certain areas. So I'm going to put an edge of grass here, then it will be bushes, and then I'm going to push some of these back and bring some of them forward so that we can see defined structures and in amongst it there will be plants, trees and shrubs. And these paints, by the way, because of the way watercolour works, I've mentioned this before, they dry out. They dry out, but as soon as I add water, they're usable again, which is one small advantage of watercolour over acrylic. Once acrylic dries, it's dry. Roger, have you considered doing a series two of the collector cards from 1993? A set from 1993? Bloody hell. I don't even know if there's a business doing those things anymore. It seemed to be very much of its day. Are collector cards still something people do? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think anything has, has a niche. You are? Anything has a niche, just depends how small the niche is. Well, back then, in 93, it was, collector cards were a very big deal. They started off with, as baseball cards in chewing gum. And then they, I suppose they were the equivalent of cigarette cards back in the mm. days when people smoked. Um, And then they were sold separately. And it was a kind of interestingly contrived thing because they were collectible, but you could just if you if they were if you could see what you were buying, you'd just go out and buy them. Or if there were a hundred, you'd buy a hundred. But they were sold in sets of ten sealed, so you couldn't tell what they were. And they might be all the same card or they might be cards you've already got. So it made it interesting I guess and that filtered through for kids as well isn't it like sticker collectible stickers and Pokemon and things cards like that yeah very 90s yeah I wouldn't have done it if I wasn't approached to do it it wasn't something that I crossed my mind but we did sell a lot well I suppose actually wouldn't be considered a lot because of the sort of business it was but I think we sold three million and I don't know if that was packs or individual cards or what but as I say it seems a big number except that relative to the scale of the industry it wasn't what were on your cards paintings there was a on the front was a painting and on the back was an explanation. There were all kinds of things that came and went um, back a long time ago. There was public telephones just before mobile phones or cell phones existed. There were public telephones and you could buy telephone cards that you could use in them. And they had two generations of them. They had purely mechanical ones, and then they had electronic ones. And those were, a, they came as a space to show art, paintings, photographs, whatever. And um, yeah, it's, uh, I, did, I did a set of those again wouldn't have crossed my mind except I was asked and thought it would be fun and we sold a lot of those 16 million I think of those wow in your landscapes do you ever 
do a balance between geometrical and organic art or do you think that right angles and edges take away from the feeling of your visions? Um, if I'm not painting and I'm designing something, for example, a piece of architecture, um, I have horizontal floors and hinges work best when they're vertical. But apart from that, I don't have many right angles and I certainly don't have many flat planes and yeah it's my architecture this would be if I was designing this for real it might look exactly like this yeah maybe I'll do that one day it would be fun Dan Coates says he met you at the Comic-Con in San Diego years ago. Oh, right. Says, was it a pleasant experience for you? I'm not sure if that's the Comic-Con or the meeting or both. Oh. <laughs> it wasn't a, a pleasant experience for who? Was it a pleasant experience for you? Oh, me? Yeah. What, Comic-Con? Yeah. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah. What were you doing there? I was invited to go and do a talk, which I did, but I had lots of friends there. Um, in particular, Michael Kaluta was there, and Freya joined me, so yeah, it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. I haven't been back since, but I would love to. I, 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 I thought it was, it was great fun. Okay, I'm about to show one of the problems of painting vertically on paper, and that is I'm resting my wrist while I try and paint something accurate. Do you ever put something behind the paper to make it a bit more structurally something to lean on or not? I should. That would be very sensible. Sensible is overrated. So. Do you want me to find you something to lean on? No, no, I was looking for this piece of high-tech equipment here. High-tech spray. Exactly. Not surprisingly, I put too much on. This is a kind of weird way to paint for me because I'm putting paint on, taking it off, moving it around, scrubbing it out, putting more on. It's strange, but it kind of works for me. So I'm kind of, kind of liking the way it's coming together. Roger, were you inspired by Gaudi? Um, I love Gaudi's work, yes. 
I love his ceramics and I love his buildings and of course the cathedral which isn't a cathedral it's the church of the sacred family and it's a Sagrada Familia I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right unbelievably beautiful yeah yeah I, I like it um, and the obvious similarity is that he didn't use many square boxes and nor do I but in actual fact a great deal of the work is very different but I, I can see that when there's not a lot of architecture that's curvilinear the few bits that are you tend to connect and that's fair enough Have you been able to commit to the rescheduled March 2022 cruise to the edge? Is that when it is? We're being told now. Oh, I didn't Date for know. your diary. You heard it here first. There you go. Well, the simple answer to that is yes. And no one's told me. So <laughs> the answer would be, as I hadn't even heard it, um, not yet. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. Waiting for the invite. Maybe, yeah. I guess maybe is the answer to that. Oh, this is nice. Carol asks, are you aware of just how many of us you've inspired to be part of the art world? <laughs> Thank you. It's strange actually because you're watching me up until now people have seen my paintings finished and to an extent you know you, you can imagine that okay here is the idea here it is executed between the idea and the execution there's no effort. And I guess what you're watching now is not really effort, but um, a, pro a process of gradually defining. Um, and it is, it is kind of coming to, into shape. This is interesting because I didn't really have a design before I started just an idea about splashing green paint around. In fact, right here, it didn't look very different from this when it started. Probably a bit darker. Do you ever use anything other than paint in your artwork, like tea leaves to get texture or something like that? Mixed media, I guess. Tea leaves? Yeah, someone here uses tea le has used tea leaves in a painting to get texture. Um, I haven't, but I definitely know people who have. Yeah. For staining the paper, really, rather than painting, but to give the paper a kind of um, pale sepia look. Mm. No, mostly paint, yeah, or pencil or ink. Patrick Moody says my tripod needs oil, which is really true. I'm trying to do some great camera work here and it's just squeaking. I'm going to bring oil next time. What's squeaking? The tripod when I move shot. Oh, then, then. I'm trying to be inventive with the camera. Oh, I see. <laughs> You'll just make people dizzy. Probably. So there is nothing behind that except the ladder. 
So when I was resting on it, I put it where the ladder was. So I started here, and of course, there's no resistance. What about, um, don't they have things for that? Oh yeah, easels. Is that <laughs> what an easel is? Roger Dean is too cool for easels. No, it's, um, yes, I could have put something behind it. Um, but up until now, I haven't rested my hand on the painting at all. I've been working with my hand in the air. Um, because an absolutely precise line hasn't been that critical. But now when I'm working on details of the architecture, it's becoming more so. Hmm. How many hours in a day do you create? Well, this is, I've worked on this since last week. Not long, maybe four hours since last week. Um, and I will try and finish it. I'm going to do a branch in the foreground that will come in into this area, which will help define the space. I may not do that live. I may, I may not. But I will finish this <laughs> one way or the other by next week. If it, for no other reason, I booked it in to be photographed for, you know, getting a high res scan done. So that's my deadline. I have to do that. Have you seen the jungle house made by Edward James, which was taken over by the jungle? It's yes. I think I have. Well, of course, I mean only photographs. And it was made in concrete, I think. Is that right? I don't, I'm not sure. Um, Dave Watkinson might know. Ha! <laughs> I see. I will check it out. Edward James, eh? Okay. Yeah. I was wondering earlier if I work as fast in front of the camera as I do when I'm alone. And um, I guess the answer is not quite, no. I work faster when I'm entirely on my own because I'm much more distracted. You know, if I'm in the middle of listening to a story or something like that. That level of distraction speeds things up. It's interesting that you call it distraction rather than focus. It's not focus on the art, it's distraction from not focus. Is that how yes. you see it? Yes, that's how I see it. I see, I mean, I remember when I was in art school even then, I had tutors who would say, stop talking, concentrate on what you're doing. And even then I thought, that's the wrong advice. You know, concentrating on what we're doing was no help. Being totally distracted was the most useful condition to be in. And that was my aim. If I was being, if we had a lecture in a classroom, which we often did then, and we were sat at a table, I always found that a very easy place to work. And because I wasn't doing a, a formal lesson in sketching, drawing something, um, it was mostly about design then, and that was a very creative time for me. And it worked in every way. I could concentrate on the lecture, better 
And because I was concentrating on that, I was able to work better. So I guess these buildings are coming out of the background a little now. Will the typography and logo from the the albums DBA, Skyscraper, Souls and Live in England also be on this album cover? And how will the Kingfisher be incorporated? I mean, maybe that's a mystery. You can well, wait and see. It's nearly not a mystery. Um, I had Mike sent me, because we've had discussions over the last week or two about the colours and the shapes. We've changed, slightly made changes to shape. Um, the, there isn't a high res scan of the Kingfisher yet. I'm getting that done when I get this done. So it's, it's kind of all moving up at the same time. And we were talking today as he laid out the cover and he put the logo on this to see how it would look. And of course, his problem and mine is that we haven't defined the front cover yet. So, you know, if the logo was going to be central and this was the front cover, then it would be here. But if it was, if that was the front cover, it would be there. So, you know, we're playing around. It's, it's still in the realm of just playing around at the moment. And it has a new title, it's no longer Holding the Heavens, it's now Halcyon Hymns. I think I've said that several times. But... <laughs> <laughs> Denise says it's interesting that you concentrate better with distraction because she needs to be alone to paint better. Now, I thought that was interesting. Um, there's a book called Deep Work by Cal Newport, which is about getting uh, that modern life is more and more distracting with things like emails and phones pinging up all over the place. And to, to do like the deep work and get into a, like a flow state, you need total lack of those distractions and kind of this intense focus. Um. Well, I'm not talking about the distractions of everyday life. I would say, hmm, I would disagree with that probably. Um, not my experience, but there is a big caveat there. And that is, it's very different for writers. Writers are distracted in the completely the wrong way by words. They, they are creating words and words coming at them are the wrong kind of distraction but for painting they're a brilliant distraction i'm not saying the raucous background of modern life is a good distraction it isn't but a good story is you know something like lord of the rings that can last a very long time <laughs> and a lot of painting done by that. Okay, I don't n normally paint this precisely. So this is something I haven't really done in years. So what was the book called? Deep Work. And I've read other books about kind of how introverts are slightly more um, suited to 
being on their own and and therefore and that that lends itself to a deep focus on on the task but i'm what sure kind there's of task? That's the, that yeah the critical thing yeah me. exactly i have talked to writers about the creative process and there is an enormous amount in common between creation of any kind but the physical interpretation of the idea taking that idea and bringing it into the world is profoundly different between writers and artists i have talked to scientists and musicians musicians a lot um, of course i don't suppose you could write music to a chapter of lord of the rings i don't know maybe you could um what's this person said oh here we've got a writer who has talk radio on whilst writing <laughs> see that would drive me mad <laughs> well what can i say everybody we're in a world full of lots of different people <laughs> yes which is a good thing horses for courses <laughs> I'm drinking because I started this evening with my voice sounding very rough, but uh, it's getting better now. From here it looks like you're drinking the paint. <laughs> Roger is not drinking the paint. Indeed not. And that probably would not be a good idea, even for fun. Well, maybe it's symbolic. It's your lifeblood. There you go. Something else that's very different about this to what the way I normally work is I sketch these in in pencil, which again I would not normally do in a painting. I haven't done that for a very long time. And when I was doing it, I realized that I didn't like drawing on paper this rough. I like, I like it when the paint, uh, pen or pencil glides over the surface and this is has too much grip in it fine for a brush because it can slither across but exasperating for a pencil what made you want to draw for this one i couldn't make those things up without sketching them out first even though i sketched them on paper I possibly could have copied them. They're not hugely symmetrical as it is. If I was doing a drawing of those, I would only draw one side and then flip it over. Um, some people are very good at drawing things that are symmetrical. <laughs> and I tend not to do that without tricks and help. Do you experience synesthesia while painting? No. Remind me, is that where you see, no, see, uh, yeah, see colours? It's where you, I don't know, hear or smell colours. Yeah. Yeah, where your senses get jumbled up. But I do find that um, if I was painting, I don't know, this, listening to a story, if I come back and I work on it, I can remember exactly the part of the story I was listening to when I 
first work there. And that's interesting. That happens even if I come back to it years later. That happens to me when I'm mucking out stables and listening to the archers. <laughs> I'm not exactly <laughs> what happened at which point of straw. I see. I didn't know you worked in stables. Yeah, I, I do. I keep horses. Do you? Yeah. That sounds fun. Yeah, it's fun. They they do kind of film work and stuff. Which is always fun. They're not your horses? Two of them are. Ah. Yeah. I knew you worked with cats and dogs, but I didn't know your horses. All the animals. All kinds. Ooh, we've got an interesting brain comment. Go on. Um, I'm trying. Okay. So if you draw whilst listening, both sides of the brain are working in sync, but it's difficult to listen to a lecture whilst writing a note to someone or reading, presumably, because that's the same, yeah, that's the same side of the brain doing two tasks. Sounds like there's something in there. Sorry, I, I, I'm not quite sure what kind of comment I should make. Well, I don't know, I just thought that was a fun fact, so I read it out. Say, say it again then. So if you're listening to music whilst you're writing, yeah. both sides of your brain are busy at once. Right. Whereas if you listen to words whilst writing, you're using the same side of your brain to do two separate things. Yes, I can see. I mean, I don't know about that, but it sounds convincing. It, it, it sounds credible. Yeah. Daniel's asked if you've mentioned the kendo quote about training the mind yet. Am I what? You haven't, but I don't remember what this quote is and I'm intrigued. I don't remember. What was the question? Okay, you have a kendo quote yeah. about training the mind. Oh, yes, yes, yes. What's that one? Well, it was a kendo quote about training, repetitive training in particular, so that you get to the point where your actions are... basically can be done without thought you know it's all muscle memory but the the quote was that you train the hand so the hand in turn trains the mind oh i remember now yeah I like that in the nick of time <laughs> Do you have any advice for artists starting out? Bloody hell. Yeah. Um, I think artists starting out are facing lots of challenges. I mean, you might be painting a picture which you'll hope someone will buy. That's one way of starting out. When I started out, I wasn't doing that. Um, I wasn't even painting, I was designing things, buildings largely. But when I started painting, I still didn't offer them for sale. Um, I really didn't want to sell paintings, I guess for 20 years. I was working for 20 years before I thought, okay, 
I need a bit more storage space. Um, but the challenge for artists who work for clients, especially big companies, and nowadays even record companies, is they very often want to own everything. And I would say, fight that. You know, you ought to keep your copyright and the original artwork. And I was very lucky in that um, when I started out, no, well before, when I was a student at the Royal College, um, a lot of the work I was doing was about patents. And I met a, a patent agent when I was still a student. And he helped me with the sea urchin chair. Uh, and about who owned it as much as anything, because the college claimed they owned it. Um, a manufacturer who I was working with thought they would own it. <laughs> and they told me, no, you own it. You are not employed by either party, so you own it. So I then went back to him with a whole bunch of other things I thought were worthy of a patent. And he said, you could patent those, but it's very expensive. And unless you've got someone, some means of exploiting these things commercially, I'd leave it for now. Leave it until you can have a commercial reason for doing it. He said, the only thing you don't have to spend money on is a copyright. You automatically own your own copyright unless you are paid, you have a job, not a freelance job, but a, a job where you go into an office every day and your job is to paint something. In that case, it's likely that you'll be defined as working for hire, in which case, the employer owns the copyright. But if you're freelance, you own the copyright in everything you do unless you sell it. You can't accidentally give it away or misplace it. You have to formally and unambiguously sell it for gain. It's a part of it. Which means the default position is if you do this, you own it. But you want to make sure you own the original painting and the copyright and that your client pays for a license to reproduce it in a context. And that's increasingly hard. Companies that have no use for it at all and tend to just leave the artwork in a drawer to rot do insist on owning it. So it's, it's a tough thing for artists, but I would say that is what you should do. You should try and resist that, try and keep it. You're a bit Marxist when it comes to painting, Roger. Sorry? Bit, a bit Marxist. Marxist? Yeah. He, his, his idea was that if you create something, as I understand it, a part of you is in that and therefore owns it. You can't you almost can't give that away or sell it. Or well, you can sell it. You can now, yeah. Yes. In, in. You, until you do, you own it. And a lot of companies want to own it, so they make it a condition, even though they have no commercial need to own it. So Some companies are the worst. Mm. They absolutely insist. And I've... Um, I've been approached, I really don't know how many times, but certainly many tens, maybe 50, 60 times by different Hollywood companies to work on movies. And I'm getting so used to their very difficult copyright situations. It's almost a given that I'll say no. Would you turn them down just because you don't want to give up copyright? Yes, and I have done many times. That doesn't stop people stealing it, as we all know. <laughs> but it does mean it's... It's it's a tricky thing. And as they say, if you can, don't get rid of it.
Oops. Behave. It's fine, we'll edit that bit out. <laughs> Um, could you please list some album covers by other artists that you feel are among the best ever? Among the best ever? Putting you on the spot here. Um, sort of. I, I, <clears throat> um, I was incredibly impressed by Rick Griffin's album, Oaks from Oxford for the Great the Dead. That was a big influence on me when I first saw it. And um, yeah, Kelly and Mouse, I like their work. Michael Kaluta's done a couple. He's pretty amazing. I haven't mentioned Storm, but of course Storm and Hypnosis. But they tended to work with a lot of artists and more about design and photography than being an artist. So. Drew Struzan was very good. And of course Peter Blake, who did Sergeant Pepper. I don't know if I want to ask this question. And then. Okay. <laughs> ask that one instead. What of Peter Lloyd what of Peter Lloyd's album covers? <laughs> I don't know what that means. What of, sorry. What or maybe which ones? Which ones of Peter Lloyd's album covers? Ooh, remind me of which ones he's done. Okay. Bol, Bol Gregmar, I'm sorry if I butchered your name. Which album covers are we referring to here? And what would you like to know? The favourites? What I, I want to know is the name rings a bell, but I can't remember which ones he did. So they'll have to be a little bit forgiving of my memory. <laughs> Maria and the DBA team thank you from the bottom of their heart. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> thank you. Um, Peter, Peter Lloyd did Rod Stewart, Jefferson Starship, Libra and a few others. Which Jefferson Starship? Not sure. The celestial airbrush stuff from the seventies. Yes, I like it. Yes. There we are. Yes, and I like the cover for Jefferson Starship. Yeah. I'm sorry, I couldn't remember his name. But I have to say something. We've had a technical problem with anything that runs over an hour. Oh. So we're going to have to make sure we finish okay. in less than an hour. Yeah. And we started a few minutes early, didn't that's we? That's true, that's true. So Three minutes early? Yeah, we're now coming up to ten to eight. So we've got five minutes yeah. most. So if, if there are any more questions, you've got five minutes. <laughs> oh, that guy also did the artwork for the movie Tron. That's a great movie. Sid Mead did that. Sid Mead. Sid Mead did the, it was the, well, I don't know if he was production designer, but all the images you see of Tron were his designs. Yeah. Sid sadly died in January this year. Oh. He also did Blade Runner and 2010 and all kinds of films. Oh, Hugh's saying he could edit it, but then, well, what would he do? Just cut out all my amazing jokes to leave room for, <laughs> for everything else. 
What's this? He says he could edit the video if I think that's if we run over an hour. Who said that? Hugh Shields. Oh, Hugh. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Yeah, he's had to do that before. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell him. Don't forget to cut out all her amazing jokes. <laughs> no. <laughs> all right. Um, are these little bowls specifically for painting? What are they? Actually, you usually see them in a laboratory, not an artist's studio. And I bought them from somebody who had a shop where they bought a lot of them. And um, as I said, I think they're more for scientific use than artistic use, but I love them. They are and an empty one. Where are they from? Ikea. Yeah, they're very bell like. No. <laughs> I'm holding it. Oh cool. They have a nice note to them. <laughs> that's that's a good requirement when finding a painting vessel. Critical. Yeah. Test the noise. <laughs> okay. Well, it looks like we'll run out of time. <laughs> yeah. When Fry and I do the Q and A about this, oh, Christabel, make yes. sure you get as many names as you can, not just questions. Okay, I'll do names. If you ask a question, you will be named, <laughs> and hopefully not shamed. There you go. Um, we were going to show you the proofs for the new calendar tonight because it's now been done but they haven't been delivered here so they're going to come in the next 24 48 hours and when Freya and I do our Q&A we'll talk about the new calendar and new products and things like that so um, yeah it'll be good and the other thing I've got to mention is we're starting another class for the online school we will be launching it on the 7th of October and we will be starting the classes on the 28th of October so if you're interested and want to sign up there will be you can do that from the 7th onwards um, have I got any other things I've got to mention today <laughs> thank you very much for joining us um, if it's Martin watching this I'm ever so sorry it's not absolutely finished but it is booked in to be scanned, so it will be finished in time for that. And then we can show you the finished thing. And if you're interested, you can buy the album, which I would highly recommend. And I think it'll be a CD for sure, maybe even a vinyl. I don't mm -hmm. know, but I'll find that out. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. It was an honour you came. Thank you.